boxes of affirmative veteran to make the fold of public and domestic, the site for not being the everyday, but no less consequential and world-making stakes and claims to the promise of pleasure in the what might happen of acts that are never just private. The installation was composed of 10 glass sliders resembling old specimen slides arranged on stainless steel shelving. Seven of the sliders contain original SX-70 Polaroids, one the fragment of a stained mattress cover, and two, this text printed on sheer silk organza, text I'm going to read to you. You asked me to explain what happened when you and I went to the department store around the corner from what was home that summer to find the mattress cover for the bed. I just keep replaying what remains of the scene of the counter in the linens department in my head, reordering the elements of that moment when she turned, what led up to it, what happened afterwards, like specimen slides that refused to stay put. I keep thinking about how Sigmund Freud went from developing a new method for staining microscope samples of nerve tissue to the investigation of what symptoms would appear if you talk on that couch. Pressed up against the limits of understanding, the scene in line of the linens department shifts under the glass of its perspectives. The crossing of what I imagine it might be like in your position, and I'm no more certain of how it feels from mine, from hers, from somewhere outside the immediate dynamics of the encounter, and yet also waiting to pay, as a witness, an injured party, an analyst, as if the details and material stuff of daily life was a dossier for a case study, the evidence from a crime scene, a legal case, the charged and anxious terrain of seepages and stains to be kept at bay, the keepsake residue of a hot and bothered afternoon. What stands out for most for me is that even though you didn't recognize all the phrases she used, you felt their sting anyway. One word in particular reverberates, the charge of indecent, and its echo of outcries over indecent exposure. You know if I was asked to write a response to the question, does public sex matter? For petite mort, recollections of a queer public. The little blueprint of a book of drawings and collected commentaries on your shelf. In it, you've read how the US Supreme Court decision in Lawrence versus Texas decriminalized sodomy, but only by extending equal protection not so much to sex, whether in private or public, but to the private exercise of, quote, enduring social, excuse me, that's an interesting slip, um, the private exercise of enduring personal bonds. Buying a mattress cover might seem the perfect symptom of internalized shame in this moment in which sex for its own sake and the politics of sexual freedom would appear to have given way to the evacuation of the street in a flight to take cover under the domestic refuge of homemaking, the compulsory act of a domesticated queerness, the tidy housekeeping of sex that doesn't just stay home and clean up after itself, but anticipates any potential leakage, prophylactically encasing itself in the white linens of assimilation. But what trips you up may well be that the question of whether public sex matters collides with the problem of what constitutes an affront to public decency on a mattress cover that doesn't hide or shield, but rather serves as the projection screen and contact sheet that exposes how the borders of public and private are not only permeable, but no boundary resolves the soaking bleed of desire and fear around what sex is or should be. You weren't kissing me. You weren't even holding my hand. Perhaps it was in the crackling atmosphere, the electricity of your body, the air of anticipation about what you do with me on that mattress cover, not impermeable, but ultra believable. The installation of kissing on Main Street turns on the accidental coincidence of consonants that in English language usage, public displays of affection inhabit the same letters as those of personal digital assistant. Kissing on Main Street enacts this double entendre that embeds the fleeting pulse of the sensitive and emotional in the hardware of the technological as a prerogative part for the politics of passion in the street, but through a reanimation of the older dreams of make love, not war, and that instant camera that evaded the public darkroom by enabling the recording of erotic acts that challenge everyday policing of the norms of sex. 
The display of affection may not be the primary animating reason for the smartphone devices that have largely replaced other portable information managers and condensed the taking, making, and socially networked transmission of an image into the same device. But there's arguably an affective and performative logic to this accident of acronyms. PDA compresses two seemingly very different ways of translating what would seem the highly personal or internal feeling, desire, or fantasy into the externally and socially transmissible. And this makes for no end of trouble. While one version of PDA takes its kisses in the street, the other sends its data, which might be an XO or XXX, via phone, text, or email. Yet it would be a mistake to imagine that one is more private than the other. In a U.S. context, as the cases of so-called gay bullying enacted through the posting of sex tapes, the upset over underage sexting, and the outcry over, and do you remember this, Representative Anthony Weiner's crotch shot, attest the web-enabled smartphone blurs as it transgresses the lines between private consensual acts and public displays, not just of what's arguably euphemized as affection and sex, but also that larger range of acts affects and gestures that don't fit easily under either the term sex or affection. The PDA is not just a vehicle for PDA in word and image, but also in the unpredictable itineraries of its transported and transporting messages, raises troubling ethical and political questions about how public sex and public affection matter. But the instant developing Polaroid taken in public spaces does analogous but different kinds of work in going slower, taking up space time, and generating a tangible but fragile single object right then and there. The embrace for a Polaroid occupies a complex temporality that can be further activated. In plotting for kisses, psychoanalyst Adam Phillips writes that truly infectious, kissing may be our most furtive, our most <coughs> reticent sexual act, the mouth's elegy to itself. As an act on the fungible edges between the reticent and the flagrant, inside and outside, oral and general, private and public, kissing, or even better, plotting for kisses, promises to be or become infectious, viral. But of and for what? It's precisely the volatile unpredictability of how affect travels between bodies, in and through the technology of the camera, and fragile print that's at the heart of kissing on Main Street. If, as Joni Mitchell sang, in France they kiss on Main Street, what happens when I, or we, take plotting for kisses uneasily preserved in Polaroid emulsion onto a website and into a gallery? There are the dense and arguably irresolvable issues of permission and permissiveness, exposure, the ongoing negotiations with the breakdown of possibility in the wake of a moment of physical contact. What happens in and to the Polaroid once the intimacy it would seem to make last forever is no longer, or certainly no longer the same? And what does it entail to witness such acts? On February 14, 2009, the Mexican government called on the citizens to come out and kiss to break the record previously held by Tuzla. Bosnia Herzegovina, with the largest number of people kissing in one place at one time. The question is not merely one of numbers, but rather what kinds of kisses and across what police lines of identity and affiliation. In his The Nation article against bullying or on loving queer kids, Richard Kim invoked the world remaking power of the imaginative as in. Quote, so when faced with something so painful and complicated as gay teen suicide, it's easier to go down the familiar path, to invoke the wrath of law and order, to create scapegoats out of child bullies who ape the denials and anxieties of adults, to blame it on technology, if we just got rid of cell phones, for example, or to pare down homophobia into a social menace called anti-gay bullying, and then confine it to the borders of a schoolyard it's tougher, more uncertain work creating a world that loves queer kids, that wants them to live and thrive. A try. Try as if someone's life depended on it. However, even, or perhaps especially after the recent decisions about gay marriage, 
and policies and events that seem to make certain kinds of kisses a government demand. Actual social transformation might seem an awful lot to lay on an act of slight and seemingly inconsequential and easy to tolerate as a witness kiss. What might be taken as an act of disavowal, a kissing your troubles goodbye, may also be another way to whistle in response to the commands and demands of global capital. Putting your lips together to blow may still, in the image transmissions and contacts of display of Polaroid, enact the promise of new ways of remembering other kinds of community and forging affective bonds that give alternate reason to live. The Polaroids and kissing on Main Street are seen here as they were installed last month at the uh, Grand Valley State University Art Department's Office for Public Culture in downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan for a public conversation with Anna Campbell on public sex, public gender. The Polaroids take on the politics of public intimacy, stealing into <laughs> public space, plotting for kisses, and mining the vernacular conventions of tourist photography to infectiously insinuate queer possibilities with the menacing mimesis of butch femme embraces. This summer, I'll be finishing the installation plan for Kissing on Main Street, building the peep show boxes in which the Polaroids will be displayed, uh, so a different structure from what you're seeing on the screen. These display devices will take the form of translucent plexiglass boxes to which the visitor will peer to see the Polaroids affixed to mirrored plastic, thus encountering the Polaroids in a scene in which they find themselves multiply enfolded as a body being seen looking. I'll also be doing a stay on Fire Island to do a project on public sex that builds on the work begun in Kissing on Main Street. If Fire Island Pines was the earthly gay paradise of sex on the beach, as Edmund White suggests in the introduction to Tom Bianchi's collection of Polaroids, taken between the introduction of the SX-70 in 1972 and the decimations of the AIDS epidemic. One might ask with tongue not exactly in cheek, where's the island Lesbos? Titled Cherry Picking on Fire Island, this project tracks the photographic trails of Bianchi, Peter Pujar, Robert Mapplethorpe, and Judy Lynn, to name a few, to ask after what forms of sex, intimacy, and desire don't register photogenically. Exploring the gendered sites of public sex and the contestations over space, this series of Polaroids aims to materialize its own version of a queer heaven through the meat rack woods of the public sex space, it's called the meat rack, that actually divide and yet also connect uh, the uh, pines, um, understood as gay, um, Cherry Grove, understood as lesbian, through a queer aesthetics of kind of rivalrous and yet also admiring, desiring, Camp sincerity. On the hinge of this ambivalent affective charge, I turn here to the theoretical and political work I'm suggesting queer aesthetics may do. And for me, one of its crucial sites and also tools is the volatile index of the photographic sign. Queer aesthetics might seem a redundancy. It's not just that queer theory has been characterized as doing its political and cultural work, working it, we might say, by the play of its own style. The incarnation of style as a narcissistic devotion to the surface is one of the cliched figures the work registers as queer. The cliches of queer as the aesthetic and fleshed live and bleed in the branding stereotypes of a queer subject marked and constructed from a playmate outside. The branding stereotype of the queer as aesthetics incarnate figures the queer subject is consumed by the fashion but also tarted up by the tarnished brush of the taste of which the queer subject is at once positioned as the avant-garde arbiter, and yet also the shamed too. It's not at all surprising, then, that the subject of aesthetics might name a squirm. Steward as we are, or threatened to be, on the glittered but no less pointed end of our own efforts to turn the conditions and signs of stigmatic injury into the sites of, if not flourishing with next but flourish, then survival with tattered sequins. We may refuse the portrayal of queer as the aesthetic, or to recirculate the late Jose Munoz's so redolent term for the negotiation of the highly charged ambivalence of attraction laced with repulsion, routed not to some fantasized outside, but through the very figures that may most painfully stick to us.